Sunday Morning Devotion God's Purpose in Giving the Law by Dr. Earl White Our meditation this morning will be on the Law of Moses as a schoolmaster. Paul deals with the Law in Galatians. There were those in Galatia teaching that the keeping of the Law was essential to salvation. Paul tells them that anything, including the Law, that is inserted as part of the gospel, perverts the gospel, and makes it ineffective as a means of salvation. We see that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. For what purpose did God give the law? Galatians 3, 24 through 26 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The was in wherefore the law was means to become or to come into existence. It is a perfect, active, indicative verb. The perfect tense is completed action in the past, which completed action has present results. This means what it was, it remains. What the law was and is, is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The word schoolmaster means, according to Strong's, a tutor, a guardian, a guide of boys. Among the Greeks and the Romans, the name was applied to a trustworthy slave who were, in char- who were charged with the duty of supervising the life and morals of boys belonging to a better class. The boys were not allowed so much as to step out of the house without them before arriving at the age of manhood. Verse 25 says, But after that faith has come, we are, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. To say the least, that is a relief. The story in the scripture that illustrates this the best is John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. And Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down, and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The representatives of Israel, or the law of Moses, brought this woman to Jesus. She had clearly broken the law. They did it not for the right reason, but they did it just the same. Truth is truth, whether you do it for the right reason or not. She had been caught in the very act. It is interesting at this point that these men were a little on the dumb side. 
It's amazing how dumb smart men can be when their minds are clouded with malice and hatred, like those educators who teach evolution. If they were so interested in keeping the law of Moses, why didn't they bring the man? Surely they must have known that Jesus would bring that up. However, he was very nice to them and only wrote it on the ground. Where is the guy? Well, I'm not sure that's what he wrote on the ground, but it's as good a guess as yours. Now, how would Jesus answer this airtight case? He simply said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Some say that Jesus was saying, He that is without the same sin, begin the stoning. This is an interesting guess. It is certainly a possibility. But what if Jesus had just confronted them with the insincerity and cruelty that were obvious? That these men, to win an argument with him and make him look bad, brought a woman who is rightly condemned by the law, but the but let the man go, that was as guilty and justly condemned by the same law. I wonder why they did not bring the man. I wonder if he may have been the son of one of the leaders present. Have you ever condemned someone for committing a sin, but kept your mouth shut when your son or your friend's son committed the same sin. Every hard-boiled preacher I have ever known, including myself, can be categorized with these men who brought this poor woman to Jesus. I have discovered that I can't be consistent when administering the law, but can in preaching grace. Well, when Jesus rose up from writing the second time, there was no one left but the woman and him. I wonder where the disciples were. Boy, Jesus got a whole crowd, didn't he? I want you to know I left with them. I wouldn't know what went on after this if I didn't have my Bible. When Jesus raised up this time and only the woman was there, he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Then comes this great answer. She said, No man, Lord. Man can't condemn. All men are guilty. It is true God used human instruments to carry out the penalty of the law in the Old Testament. But it was God, through the law, that condemned. He is the only one who can rightfully cast a stone. So Jesus is the only one in the crowd that could rightfully cast a stone at her. The law had done its job. It had brought this sinful woman to Jesus. And Jesus is grace. What happens when you bring a rightfully condemned sinner to grace? Grace sets him free. This is exactly what Jesus did. He said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. May the Lord bless these words to our heart today. Complete in me, no work of mine Could take, dear Lord, the place of thine Thy blood hath poured and bought for me, and I shall stand complete in thee, yea, justified.